1986, Van Halen released their first album with new lead singer Sammy Hagar. 5150 became the band's first number one album in the U.S. and it included three top 25 hits. It also contained a mind-blowing rocker. I mean, a perfect pairing of Eddie's guitar and Sammy's voice that should have been a massive hit. Next up, the story of this Van Halen classic with commentary and interview with Sammy Hagar himself. Hey, music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. I hope everybody had a great holiday. Make sure that you hit the subscribe button right now. Be a part of this community full of daily history, rock history. I mean, you never know what we'll feature on here from day to day or who we'll interview. So make sure to subscribe, click the bell so you never miss out. Also, hit us up on Patreon to be a part of curating this era. Now, 1986 was uh, just another golden year in the wondrous decade of the great 80s. It was the year of big singles. I mean, there was Say You, Say Me from Lionel Richie. Say you, say me. Kyrie by Mr. Mister. Gloria Love by Peter Cetera. as well as an English artist who conquered the U.S. charts, Pet Shop Boys with West End Girls, West End Girls. Simply Red with Holding Back the Years, Holding back the years. and The Human League with Human, Come on, baby, dry your eyes. got the stories of a lot of these songs with the artists that will feature down the road. And there was also the big life-changing albums like Paul Simon's Graceland, uh, Peter Gabriel's So, The Smiths, The Queen Is Dead, one of my favorites ever, Black Celebration by Depeche Mode, and of course the big pop explosion, you know, Janet Jackson, Control. Madonna, True Blue. And Whitney Houston's debut album continued to climb the charts, hitting number one. The Top Gun soundtrack heated up in the summer. And of course, Van Halen followed up their massively successful album, 1984, with a new record. Now with the album 1984, um, Van Halen just missed the number one spot because of Michael Jackson's thriller. Of course, Eddie played on Beat It. Michael Jackson's thriller dominance went even into 84. Lead singer David Lee Roth left to pursue a solo career, as everybody knows, and Van Halen started looking for a new singer. We've, of course, covered that in depth in previous videos that you can check out, as Eddie considered a few different paths to go forward, but in the end, it was rightfully the Red Rocker, Sammy Hagar, who became the new voice. The first time Sammy went down to meet with the band, uh, he had cut off all of his hair as he had just come off his solo VOA tour. And Alex Van Halen took one look at him and he said, and I quote, you look like somebody put a donut on your head and cut it off, end of quote. It's pretty funny. As Sammy uh, would relate in his book Red, which is a great read, you gotta check it out. The first time he saw Alex after that comment, Alex was drunk as a skunk. He was just pounding a whole case of malt liquor. Uh, he would pass out a couple of times a day, wake up and then I guess shotgun two or three beers Eddie would uh, do that as well, along with lighting up a lot of cigarettes. It was the, the rock and roll life. Eddie lived in a pretty modest house and had just converted the garage into the studio that he would deem 5150 after the police code for picking up a crazy person. According to Sammy, they were recording through a homemade board that could have uh, come out of a Cracker Jack box. And that was built by engineer Don Landy. Landy, of course, could make the board sound brilliant, as Sammy would say. Uh, he'd say that the studio also smelt like a bar. Eddie, at that moment, was a chain smoker, and there was ashes everywhere, I guess. Eddie's guitars were all over the floor, leaning up against the walls or the amps on chairs. Sammy would describe it as beautiful. <laughs> Apparently, um, Eddie was living out of his suitcase, even though he'd been back from being out on the road for months. Eddie and his wife, Valerie, at that time uh, didn't have maids. Uh, Eddie was so focused on the music that he didn't really care about all the material stuff. He just wanted to create great music. The first day Sammy came in to meet them, Eddie, Alex, and Michael Anthony had been up 
all night writing what would become uh, Summer Nights and Good Enough. When Sammy arrived at around noon, none of them had even been to bed yet. From there, Sammy and the band just started jamming, you know, with Don Landy recording everything, of course. Sammy just started uh, making up lyrics on the spot to Summer Nights, inspired from hearing Eddie's brilliant riff. The rest of the song, you know, Sammy just kind of scattered his way through it. He would do the same with Good Enough. Um, Sammy conveyed that Eddie and the rest of the band, they they were just extremely impressed as Sam was singing Eddie's guitar licks with him. I guess they jammed for five hours on that first session. They would say, and I quote, we got a band. <laughs> no matter what you know, the DLR fans say, which I'm one, Sammy was the perfect singer for that moment in time, and the music that Eddie and Sammy created was just magical. Starting with what would become the first single from the new band, Why Can't This Be Love, that went to number three on the Billboard Hot 100, And it actually went to number one on the Cashbox charts. Now, uh, it's vital to recognize that while Billboard ranks singles weekly, you know, mixing the the total airplay on radio stations and single sales from all over the U.S., Cashbox gave the rankings via all sales and airplay of songs without splitting up genres in order to formulate the generalized popularity of a single's overall influence. So many singles hit number one, on the cash box charts that didn't on Billboard and vice versa. Uh, There's no denying though that cash box was more generalized in their offering, giving songs a more definitive ranking. But of course, uh, Casey Kasem used Billboard's ranking for his show, The American Top 40. Therefore, Billboard had the upper hand, but it doesn't mitigate the importance of cash box. So in other words, Why Can't This Be Love was a number one hit. It's one of those songs that uh, the band had to know would be massive, at least I think. I asked Sammy about that. Here's what he said. Let me ask you about Why Can't This Be Loved because it went to number three. I mean, it was a a huge song. Did you know that that was a hit? I mean, did you guys kind of just know like, okay, we just wrote a hit? Do you really know when you've got a great song? Like how do you, and, and if so, how do you know? Because yeah. sometimes you don't. Like, I, I, I usually don't. But why can't this be love? I did. It was like, yeah. I'm going, this is a hit. This is what everybody's, all my old record companies were begging me to write. It's yeah. a pop hit that's rock. So, you know, like, so I was happy with it. I knew it was a big, badass groove it, and it had a great melody. It's not what it takes. And it was a little edgy, and Eddie took a, you know, had a lead guitar solo in it, right? Illegal top forty, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, no yeah. guitar solo. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I knew it. So you knew and, it. Yeah, yeah. And and when Mo Austin walked in the room and we played him that song live, and he goes, puts his finger in the air, he goes, "I smell money." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that comment. It was so cool. You know, Mo Austin signed Frank Sinatra, Jimi Hendrix. You oh, know, yeah. what I mean? come on now, keep yeah. going. And, oh, uh, yeah. and he says that, I'm going, yep, me too. Of course, his Why Can't This Be Love was climbing the chart and uh, continuing to, to its peak position. It pushed 5150 to the number one spot on the Billboard Album 200 list, a first for Van Halen. The album would actually spend three weeks at number one, breaking up a 14-week reign by Whitney Houston's self-titled debut and setting the stage for four straight number one albums with Sammy at the helm, which is amazing. Van Halen would then connect with two consecutive number 22 hits with their singles, Dreams, and Love Walks In. Valerie Bertinelli adored the song, Love Walks In, I guess. That's what Sammy says. According to him, she made Eddie specifically listen to the lyrics, each one, um, and it made Eddie choke up. After three serious singles about you know love and dreams, their fourth single was released, and it was an absolute balls to the wall, uppercut to the senses, heart-stopping rocker. This one of my favorites of the Eddie and Sammy era. 
the best of both worlds, you know, seem like a tip of the hat to ACDC. I mean, I remember the first time I heard it, I just <laughs> kept turning the dial up on my boom box. I turned it to five and then six and then seven worried my dad would yell at me. And then all the way up to 10, this was before I'd seen Spinal Tap because I was only like 10 years old, I think. What we do is if we need that extra push over the cliff, you know what we do? Uh, put it up to 11. 11, exactly. I kept trying to force the knob past 10, thinking it would matter. It wasn't loud enough. I remember thinking that if I just turned it a little harder, I'd get more sound. And I forced it for a minute and off came the knob. This was the song that broke my stereo. Of course it was. The song was actually released as a single. Now, it didn't chart on the Hot 100. It went to number 33 on the rock charts, which is actually laughable. This song should have been a number one on the rock charts. It should have gone at least top 10 on the Hot 100. It's such a ball buster. I mean, this is such a, just a fun song to watch live. From the Live Without a Net video, which I saved up on, all my money to buy on VHS uh, the next year. Watching Eddie and Sammy and Michael Anthony just jamming together is just pure bliss. I mean, they were having such a great time together. You watch it and it just, it just gives you goosebumps. It just makes the hair on your neck stand straight up. This is exactly what rock and roll is all about and exactly what's missing from mainstream modern music. I watch it now, of course, with a touch of sadness due to losing the genius Eddie. And the fact that this kind of chemistry that used to be so prevalent in the music of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, some in the 90s, it's just not there anymore. Everyone is so focused on, you know, the big spectacle of screens and outfits and 100 dancers. Miss the entire point of the power of live music being played by real players with real talent, where the music is the star, not the pyrotechnics or the background dancers. This was Van Halen. 100% rock and roll, 0% BS. The Best of Both Worlds is a classic of the Van Halen canon, and the story of how the song was created is just as riveting. Here's what Sammy said about it. Now, as we go into this interview, I want to mention our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. The glasses I wear on the show every single day. Start the new year off with a new pair of glasses if you need it, sunglasses, uh, regular glasses. Go design your own and see how you look by doing the virtual 3D try-on at zenny.com. So here is Sammy with the story. Best of both worlds, which is, uh, you know. One of my favorites. It's, it's a little bit of a, of a nod to ACDC. Um, almost like uh, my version or my generation's version of that. You know, I love that song, and, and so do, does everybody else. Tell me about that. Well, uh, Ed had that written musically, and he was noodling around with the vocal. He didn't have words, but he was noodling around with the vocal, and I, I didn't, I didn't like it. And he played it for me, and I said, "Man, I really dig this riff, but I don't like, I don't want to sing that." You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and so. He was just going, ah, da, 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 da. What, I don't even, I couldn't tell you what it was, but it wasn't memorable. So uh, I liked that song. So I went, I, I listened to it and I sang, I jammed a little bit. I didn't have a chorus or nothing. And I went to my house and I'm jumping in the shower. I'm trying to think of, write a song, what am I going to write lyrics about? I was like, I don't know. Na, 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 you know, that's pretty funky. That's almost like staple singers the way I'm singing. I'm singing very R and B in the verses. Right, right. Very R and B. And, uh, so I, I, I got, and I jumped in the shower. I got home about two in the morning, Eddie's at hour smokers, you know, and, and uh, they, the room, I came home, I stuck like cigarettes, I couldn't stand, so I always took a big old shower. I got in a friggin' shower and I went, I'm not the best. And I just said, oh, psh, damn, I had to jump out of the shower, I'm drying, I'm trying to get paper and it's wet and finding a pencil. It was the biggest mistake, man. <laughs> I mean, I'm in there, not a mistake, but it was just very, very like it, annoying what I had to go through. Yeah, yeah. And then I kept, yeah. I'd get back in the shower and I'd, and I'd say, all right, I'll pass. Uh, I've got, 
And then I it's to come out, oh man, I, oh no, no, oh verse, oh, you know, it's like, you know, huh. there's a picture in the gallery of Fallen Angel. Yeah, yeah. And I started talking about things I've seen in in at, at the Louvre in Paris. I saw this photograph that just touched my heart so hard. I felt like that was my mother in a past life or something in this, yeah. in this painting. And uh, I started talking about all that stuff, and I just got so excited. I was, I mean, that song was inspired, man. Oh, yeah. And I went nuts, man. I can't, I stayed up all night. I couldn't sleep. I finished it, eh, went in the next day, and I said, you know, play that track, man. Play that. Just, oh, yeah. You know, and when I started singing Best of Both Worlds, I saw the guys in the control room, the engineer and the, <laughs> and people. They jumped up in the air, threw their hands in the air. I mean, people were fucking going crazy. Oh, it was really, up. really awesome. Oh. I mean, that was whoo. I should have talked about that in my book. I, I guess I should have. You should have interviewed me for that for my book because that, yeah. that's that's really what happened right there. The truth is, Eddie Van Halen's genius playing and uh, chemistry with, with David Lee Roth and Sammy Hagar really gave us fans the best of both worlds. It's been months and I still can't believe that he's gone. Man, we miss you, Eddie. Leave us a comment about this amazing song and album. What are your memories of 5150? To get this album and this shirt right here, click on our Amazon links below. If you like our content, we do invite you to subscribe. We'd love to have you. Be a part of keeping the music alive. Click on our Patreon link. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Stay safe out there.